Okay, so in this video I'm going to look at two source interference. So I'm not going to look at single slits or diffraction gratings, I'll do those in a later video. I'm going to look specifically at two source interference, look at why we get the different patterns that we do and the equations we use to model them. Okay, so let's first recap a few things that we came across in my videos on progressive and stationary waves. So, if we want constructive superposition to occur, so the amplitudes to add together, we need two progressive waves to meet in phase with each other. And to get destructive, we need to make the two waves meet in antiphase with each other, or a phase difference of 180 degrees. So that's the conditions we get for constructive and destructive superposition. And if they meet in antiphase, and they have the same wavelength, frequency, and speed, they will completely cancel each other out, leaving nothing behind. So this is essentially what we've met before, and that will be relevant to this video. Okay, so let's apl start applying this to two-state interference. So before we do that, I need to define a term called coherence. So I just want to explain a little bit what it means. So essentially, to define coherence anyway, it's when two or more wave sources have a fixed phase difference. That is coherence. And the way we achieve that is by making sure that the two sources have the same speed, produce waves at the same speed, and the same frequency or wavelength. That's how you make sure phase difference stays the same throughout. Okay, so if we have a fixed value for that, or if these conditions are met, they're said to be coherent. And if we're going to make an interference pattern, which is what we're going to do with our double slit, we need them to be coherent. So that's the first condition under which we form these. So much like we had these conditions for forming stationary waves, it's the same for an interference pattern. Okay. So what we've got is two sources of waves here. It doesn't matter for now what kind of waves they're producing. We've got source A and source B, and they're both point sources, which means they produce waves that go out in circles around them. So like dropping a pebble in a load of water, you get the ripples going out in all directions. That's what point sources of waves do. And these lines you can see on here, I've marked the positions you find an amplitude or maximum displacement of the wave. And halfway between these lines is where you would find a minimum displacement there. So that's what you can see. So if you look at this where this green X is here, we can see from source A, it's at an amplitude of maximum position, and from B, it's at a maximum position. So there, we get constructive superposition, because an amplitude, met an amplitude, they're clearly the same wavelength, and they're traveling at the same speed, because they're traveling the same distance in the same unit of time. So we've got a coherent source, and we've got them meeting in phase, so we're going to get constructive superposition at this point. If we look at this point, this red one here, so from source A, that's at a maximum. From source B, that's halfway between two maxima, so that's a minimum. So a maximum's met a minimum, so they completely cancel each other out, and we get destructive superposition at that location. So we can go through this process for all of the positions where these two waves meet, and what you do is you build up this picture. So the green lines represent anywhere where constructive superposition occurs, and the red lines represent where destructive superposition would occur uh, when a maximum meets a minimum there. And that's what we get. And if we keep the sources at the same frequency, producing waves at the same speed, this pattern will be the same every single time. Okay, so one of the things that comes up at this point is, okay, but what if the sources aren't in phase with each other. So what I mean is, when source A is producing a maximum, maybe source B is producing a minimum at that time. So the sources are 180 degrees or pi radians out of phase with each other. Then people ask, well does that still make an interference pattern? Is that still coherent? And the answer is yes, it is. Because as long as you keep this phase difference the same, that's a fixed phase difference, so that is coherent. So I've marked with these red dashed lines where if we made A 180 degrees out of B, the red dashed lines mark where the new maxima are for source A. So you can see here where we previously had a maximum, now a minimum meets a maximum, so actually we now get destructive interference. 
and we actually now get constructive where we used to have destructive interference at these locations here. So they've essentially swapped over. So what that means is you just get maxima at different locations. You still make an interference pattern, you just essentially swap over the maxima for a minima and a minima for a maxima if you make them 180 degrees out of phase with each other. So you've still got an interference pattern there. Okay, so that's uh, the idea of coherence and this is the idea of two source interference. Uh, let's move on to look at some examples of how this is done with different waves. Okay, so here we've got two source interference with light waves, specifically in this case with a red laser beam. So what we can see from the pattern is we get these blobs. These are what we call fringes. And what we can see is these fringes are all the same size and they have equal spacing as you go along. And they have these black regions in between where destructive interference or destructive superposition has occurred. If we plot these, like the intensity of the light at each fringe uh, against this, what we find is this central maxima here is the most intense or the brightest. The most photons are going that way. So that's why it's the brightest. And then as we go outwards, this brightness decreases here. So as we go out this way, the intensity of the light or the brightness decreases. And as we can see here, the black bits in between is where destructive superposition has occurred and the two waves have cancelled each other out. So the light from one slit and the light from the other slit have met in antiphase and cancelled each other out. So let's investigate a little bit more about what's going on to produce that interference pattern. So first of all, We've illuminated both slits with the same laser, so we can model that as essentially we've got uh, waves coming in all in the same direction, and the same waves are going to both slits that we're using to make our interference pattern. What happens next is when it passes through the slit, the waves are diffracted, and the reason they're diffracted is because they've encountered something a similar size to their wavelength. So if ever a wave meets something similar size to it, it's going to diffract, which means it spreads out in all directions like this. So it becomes very much like the point sources that we saw earlier. So what we've got here is we can see the two sources are diffracted out and they're now superimposing on each other. So we get regions of constructive and destructive superposition at those points as long as we have the same speed and frequency waves on each slit, which we do. And so the phenomenon of this interference pattern with light was investigated by a scientist called Thomas Young, who you may have come across already because you might have looked at the Young modulus part of the course before you've looked at waves. Now his, probably his most famous work was his work discovering the wave nature, nature of light um, and he did that using a double slit. So at this point in time, people thought light was a particle because they believed in Newton's corpuscular theory. So Thomas Young was really quite revolutionary because he provided evidence for the first time that light was behaving like a wave. So how did he go about doing that? Well, he didn't have the kind of tech we do now. So all he had for sources of light were candles or basic lamps. So the main issue that he had was producing two coherent sources, so making these, the light from these two slits coherent. Because a, a lamp or a candle ever sends light out in all directions, and you should know this because if you walk around a light bulb, you, your brightness doesn't change, it sends it out in all directions. And if we look back, we want just waves travelling in one direction across here to make our coherent source. So the ingenious plan he came up with was to use a single slit which takes just some of the waves produced by the light and then spreads those out over the two slits, creating this condition right here. Then what can happen is the light from each slit will obviously diffract outwards at each of these slits and you'll get an interference pattern where the constructive and destructive superposition occurs. Um, so that's what we've got here. We've got, that's how he made his coherent source using the single slit. And the problem that he had was actually seeing the interference pattern because the intensity of 
or brightness of a, light, a, like a basic lamp or a candle is very low. So the brightness of the fringes is very low. So it would have needed really darkened conditions to be able to do this experiment. Okay, so moving on, you will do this experiment as well, but you're going to do it with a laser which has the advantage of being monochromatic, which means it produces only one wavelength of light, and it also produces photons travelling in, or waves travelling in only one direction. So it doesn't go out in all directions, it's only in one. So we don't need the single slit anymore, because the waves are already travelling all in the same direction. So we've got two coherent sources from the slits, and we get an interference pattern. And the other advantage of using a laser comes in here, because lasers produce very high intensity or very bright um, light, it produces light light, bright light, so we get a very bright interference pattern which is easy to see which is better. The downside being that lasers are dangerous and that can actually cause retina damage if you shine them in someone's eyes, so you have to be quite careful when you're using them. Okay, so that's the experiment that you will do. And actually, just a side note at this point, there's a really nice video on Veritasium which shows you two-source interference with this and how to build your own diffraction grating and stuff, so I'd highly recommend checking that out. Uh, but let's move on at this stage. And um, what we're going to move on to look at is how we can work out where our fringes are going to be. So what equations can we come up with to model how our two-slit interference will behave? So. Um, looking at our diagram here, so these, this is where our two slits are, and this is the screen on which we are going to view the interference pattern. And at P is where we get a fringe, and then at the centre we will also get a fringe. So this is the central one, this is the next one out, so this W is the spacing between the fringes, which we saw is the same for any of them. This big D the distance between the slits and the screen. So you can essentially form a triangle here with this point which is exactly in the middle of the two slits. So what you can do is we can get this angle inside a right angle triangle. So we can start thinking about using trigonometry to model this scenario. So this is where we have to make an assumption to get anywhere with this. And it's important that you're aware of the assumptions that we're making. So because this, these distances across here are so much bigger than the separation between the two slits. What we effectively do is we assume that these D1 and D2 are parallel to each other, which means that we can form another right angle triangle in here. And what we're doing is essentially finding the difference in distance travelled from this slit at the bottom and the slit at the top. And if we assume D1 and D2 are parallel, this distance to the bottom here is the bottom side of a right angle triangle, which is very useful. So, how does that help? Well, looking at the big triangle, we know tan theta is equal to W divided by D using our trigonometry. Using this little right angle triangle, where theta is the angle at the top here, and it's the same as this theta here, what we find is that essentially sine theta is equal to this length here divided by the hypotenuse of that triangle, which is d. Now, if this here is a maximum, that must mean the two sources, the light from each source, met in phase. And the way they do that is by travelling. A, a very specific, having a very specific difference in the distance travel. So, if this is the first maximum, what that means is this distance at the bottom is equal to one wavelength. Because if it travels an extra wavelength, it's still going to arrive at the same phase position as the other one. So that's what we're after there. We want this length here to be one wavelength. That makes the first order. If it was two wavelengths, we'd be looking at the second order, and so on, and so on, and so on. But it's critical that the path difference is a multiple of the wavelength, so the two sources are in phase at P. So what we can do is we can put this delta D, which I have on the diagram, is actually equal to one wavelength if this is the first order one. So this is where the assumption comes in. So for really small angles, and if D 
is much bigger than little d, that is going to be a really small angle. Sine theta and tan theta are pretty much the same, or they are the same for really small values. So what we can do is we can equate these two together and rearrange to make fringe spacing the subject, and we end up with this equation right here. So what we can see from this is that if we move the screen further back, we're going to increase the spacing. If we increase the wavelength, we're going to increase the spacing. But if we decrease the slit separation, which is D, we're going to actually increase the spacing as well. So those three things would act to increase the spacing between the fringes that we form there. Okay, so that's how we model it using this equation there. So let's look at how we can change the interference band. So that's how we can change the spacing. Let's look at how we can change the brightness too. So we've already looked at how the central one is going to be the brightest and the brightness decreases as we move our way out. That's because fewer photons end up at these locations as we move further out. We also looked at earlier how we can decrease the intensity of the source we're using. So moving from a, like, a, like a normal lamp to a laser, increase the intensity, so that would make our pattern brighter as well. The other thing to bear in mind is that the further away you put your screen from your slits, that essentially means the photons have to travel a larger distance to the screen, and the intensity of radiation tends to decrease the further away you get. It actually follows an inverse square law, which you'll come across more in year 13. So you have to be careful where you position your screen, because you might decrease the brightness of your intense, uh, interference pattern as well. So something to bear in mind when you're setting up your practical work. So, um, that concludes this video on two-slit interference. In my next video, I'm going to look at diffraction gratings and single slits as well, and put that all together to explain all the things that you see with interference. Um, as always, if you've spotted anything that's not quite right, or you have any questions, please do feel free to comment and ask me about it. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video.